Russian Type 3 PLO AK-47 underfolder kit. It's a kit that I never thought I'd be able to own. I kind of given up hope and looking for one for about five years that I could reasonably afford. But I was afraid that they had gotten out of reach because the prices had gotten so ridiculous that it just didn't seem realistic anymore. But fortunately for me, the kit market is in such a slump right now that I was able to pick this one up. It was listed on the AK forum and actually experienced several price drops before I claimed it. Um, I still paid a pretty big chunk of change. There's a lot of things I could have bought with the money I spent on this kit. But compared to how these were selling just one year ago, I think I got a pretty good deal. And there's a couple of reasons why it went for lower than I thought a kit like this would normally go for. And I'll get into that later because it has some warts. But, uh... I'm really enthralled to have this kit, and I wanted to make a video on it before I send it off to get built, just sort of uh, as an entertainment thing for people who are into this stuff. There's not a whole lot of people who would even know what they're looking at right here, but for those of you who do, this might be fun for you. But I just thought I'd talk about my kit in particular, um, and sort of document it for myself so I'm I can remember what it was like in the original condition before I sent it off to get built. And to just go over some of the quirks that I've discovered with these milled kits in general and with this kit in particular, because this kit uh, had a couple little surprises for me. But here's the front stub, the all important front stub. You see the Ishmash triangle, or actually. The factory wasn't going by Izhmash then, I think it was just Izhevsk, the Izhevsk factory. There's a serial number prefix, serial number, serial number suffix, this is the date code, it specifies uh, when the kit was produced. I believe, if the research I did was correct, that the K designates that this was made in 1958. So, towards the tail end of production. You can see a lot of proof marks right here. The older you get with the Russian guns, the more proof marks you can expect. They just stamp them on everything, which I really like because I think it adds a lot of character. It's a lot of cool factor. Uh, but before I get too much more into it, I'll go over the PLO kits in general and their namesake. Uh, PLO meaning the, I believe it stands for the Palestinian Liberation Organization or something militant organization, I think, that was uh, at odds with Israel for quite some time. Um, not all of these are from, or captured from the PLO, they were captured from various other organizations, you know, Israel has a lot of enemies. Um, and they were collected over the years by the Israelis. Some of them were uh, meant for actual use by the Israelis. Those can be identified by a Star of David. I can't remember if it's stamped on there like a metal stamp or if it's a white ink stamp. But you can look for the Star of David for that. Although it seems like that would be pretty easy to fake. But, you know, that's cool. But, um, the ones that we have here in the U.S. are the ones that the Israelis decided to get rid of. So instead of just destroying them, uh, their entrepreneuring spirit convinced them to cut them up and sell them to the United States as parts kits, which I think is a really good thing because, you know, it sucks that they have to be cut up at all, but I'd rather them be sent to the U.S. where they can be uh, given new life instead of just completely destroyed. So while I'm on the front trunnion, you know, I'll go over the biggest wart, which is this weld work right here, which unfortunately covered up some of the really cool stamps. I mean, I should be grateful that these two stamps were preserved, but this is an area where like a lot of the really cool, deeply struck stamps are. And there's some on the lightning cut on this side as well. But one of the previous owners, 
See, I'm going to have this kit re-welded. I'm going to have these stubs welded onto this Polish middle section. But before re-welding really became a thing, uh, I guess people thought the only real option was to uh, just sort of trash the stubs and then use the barrel and everything else on a new on a new receiver, which I think at the time were like uh, U.S. made or Bulgarian receivers. So these barrels being threaded were torqued in there pretty tight, and one of the previous owners, I have no idea how many times this kit has changed hands, but one of the previous owners, in order to get the barrel out, cut right here and cut right here to remove this corner which relieved a lot of the, I don't know, the tension or friction or whatever from the barrel, which allowed it to come out more easily. And you can actually see on the barrel, that's where you cut a little bit too far. Well, you kind of have to, to break it off the rest of the way, but not a big deal on the barrel there. But what sucked is that it kind of uh, threw in a question whether or not the front stub would be usable anymore. But what the owner before me did with the help of Brennan Stacher, was um, unfortunately the person who did this, who cut the piece off, for whatever reason decided to keep it. I mean, I would think that someone who would take a grinder and, you know, to, to the person who did this, I would assume that these two pieces, formerly one piece, would be trashed to them, so I'm surprised they didn't just throw it away. But fortunately, he kept both the front stub and the piece that he took off the front stub. So what the previous owner did before me was take a copper rod and uh, thread it to the pitch of the barrel and thread it in there. Take the piece and clamp it on, which uh, the threads on the copper rod made it line up properly. And then he welded it on there. And he did a pretty good job, amateur job, I guess. It's not going to bother me a huge deal, but you can see where it's kind of lumpy there. He left a void right there. A void right there. On the inside, you can see where the the threads themselves line up with the other threads, but there's a small gap. But due to this, um, I've already asked two builders about welding this kit for me. I asked Brendan Stager and I asked Two Rivers Arms which are supposed to be some of the best in the business, and they both turned me down because they didn't want to be liable for any headaches or you know, just liabilities in general that might arise from work that they didn't do. They didn't want to be responsible for somebody else's work, which I totally understand. But this is the original barrel to this stub. If I can get it welded in here, I mean, uh, screwed in here. see it actually goes through those threads quite nicely. There's a two rough spots once you get close to the end but honestly I'm impressed. And this is about hand tight right here. And the biggest hurdle I think when building this kit is that the barrel needs to be timed correctly which means you know these pins, these pin holes, and more importantly the gas port needs to be vertical. So it needs to be torqued so that these are vertical, and then hopefully, when they are, the bolt will headspace correctly. Since the barrel is just hand tight right now, you can see if I put the bolt in there, I can do this on camera. There we go. When I lock it in, the headspace is pretty loose but hopefully that will tighten up. You know, the tighter, the more the barrel is screwed in, the more this should protrude in here and it should tighten the headspace up. And since this is the original barrel to the original stub and the shoulder should still be the same, I believe it should headspace correctly, but that's my biggest concern right now. But while I'm talking about the barrel, I'll go over this a little bit. 
underneath the handguards, it's been pitted in the past. You can see the finish is really rough and there's a little, it's, it's freckled and speckled everywhere where pits have rusted in. This number right here is not a serial number. I don't know what these numbers uh, are supposed to represent. You can still see the remnants of a lot of proof marks on these on these milled receiver barrels. They put tons of proofs. And then there's the all-important Y in the circle. It's not an actual Y, it's a Cyrillic character, but it looks like a Y that denotes that it's a Russian barrel. And here you have the front handguard notch. And then the gas port, which this part really amazed me. It's just how big this gas port is. I actually discovered a screw of this diameter will completely go inside that gas port with some wiggle room. I thought that was kind of crazy. When you consider that like a gas port on an AR-15 is like paperclip sized. And out here, you can see the chrome lining right at the crown, which uh, kind of surprised me too. It should have made sense since the Russians were chrome lining their SKSs, which were made even prior to this. But for some reason, I was under the impression that all the AK-47s uh, had unlined barrels. But this one actually has a chrome lined barrel. And if I can get a picture of the bore, it's really sharp in there. The uh, video camera doesn't do it justice, but it's like mirror bright and super sharp. So, and this something I'll hit on later, but my belief is that this gun had a pretty hard life. It got beat around a lot, but it actually got fired very little. Uh, what else was I going to talk about? Yeah, it's all matching numbers which is something that's actually pretty uncommon with these PLO kits. A lot of the ones that you'll find will have, at best, a matching bolt or a matching carrier, but even a lot of those that I've seen, um, they'll be force matched with an electro pencil that'll be scrawled on. But there's the, I don't know what Cyrillic really character that is, the 7984 which matches the front stub. <coughs> and 7984 again on the bolt. And if you look at the actual face of the bolt here, these lugs, it really doesn't look like it's been shot a whole lot. You can see lots of proof marks there marks everywhere on this older stuff. It's a bolt carrier. It has a flush rivet holding in the gas piston. It's not really unique to these milled kits, but I think it's cool. And the piston is a little bit wobbly, which is actually part of the spec for AKs. No lightning cut on this side. The bottom of the bolt carrier has this really rounded place right here which pushes the mags, the top rounds of the mag down when the carrier cycles. It has these two little notches right here which I believe are unique to these. You can see some more proof marks there. Oh, and the bolt carrier tail. There's very little deformation which I would expect anyways, but it's just something else that indicates that this is a very low round count gun, despite how poor condition it may seem in some places. Oh, another thing I forgot about the front stub. One thing I actually didn't know about these milled kits is that they have this big lightning cut in here, which makes a ton of sense because there's no need for all the steel to be here. And covering it up is this little plate which slides in two little notches. 
Excuse my camera work, please. Slides into those little notches like that. And the person who, one of the prior owners, no telling which, for whatever reason wanted to get this off. So what they did was grind a little notch right there so that they would have a flat surface to try and hammer this thing out. And you can see they skipped it a little bit and scratched it all up. But, and it's also a little bit bent. I think when they got towards the end here, they were getting sick of it and they just kind of wrenched it out. Because if you look, the little ridge right here on both sides is kind of deformed. So, but all that can be easily fixed. What else do I want to talk about? Might as well go ahead and look at the rear stub. This is a, there's a lot of interesting things going on here. The least of which I would say is something I didn't know about uh, milled underfolders in general. Um, as opposed to stamped ones, is that the rear butt plate is actually held in place by a detent. And I'll unfold it here. And if you look on the bottom, there's these little notches cut. And when it rotates, there's a little detent inside there that clicks into that notch. And the hook right there on both sides is what prevents it from over-rotating. And you'll hear it. I did not know that. Stamped underfolders are not like that. They just fold down and then there's a little piece that presses against the arm that keeps it from over-rotating. As you can see, the generous lightning cuts on the inside there. The sling loop that would have been right here has been ripped off at some point. And on this side, very interesting, this arm has actually been broken off at some point or another and welded back on. You can see the weld there. And what's cool about this to me is that this appears to have been done by one of the previous owners. I mean, uh, it, it appears to have been done before this was made into a kit, as in by the Palestinians or whoever the Israelis captured it from, or maybe it was done by the Israelis itself, themselves. And the reason why I think that is because the weld is underneath all this paint. And the, uh, the paint is something that I've actually used for a little bit of uh, deductive reasoning on some of these parts because originally a type 3 kit like this would have been made with a blue finish like this pulpish middle stub but you know that lasted no time at all and after that after all the bluing was worn down i believe this kit was uh simply painted over to protect it from rust but something interesting is that when whoever painted it they didn't bother to take the hand guards off So, and the reason why I can tell is, if you look at the barrel under the hand guards and the gas tube under the hand guards, they're rusted all to crap. But you go out past the hand guards, and there's the paint. So most likely these hand guards were also painted at some time, black, but that's long worn off. These hand guards are in really rough shape. They practically disintegrate in my hands. Gas tube is another matching part. 7984. When I say this thing is all matching, I mean it. It's got the vented holes right here, which is particular to the milled kits. Russian ones, anyways. And one thing I thought was interesting is how tightly the gas tube locks up with the uh, gas block. It's almost SKS-like. But back to the rear stub. One of the reasons why 
see a lot of, with the age of these PLO kits, these were imported in like 2002 and 2003 at the latest. So all of these kits have had a lot of time to be mixed and matched and, you know, separated from their original parts. One of the coolest things about the PLO kits is that as they were imported, all of the parts in the kit were put in one box. And the kit that you got is exactly as it was when the Israelis cut it up. Nowadays, oh, and of course the other cool thing about PLO kits is that you get the original barrel. But nowadays, the way these kits are done, basically, like, all the gas tubes are put together, and all the rear side blocks are put together, and then when they get back to the United States, they get parted out, and, for example, with the Argonne's kits, I've had a lot of Argonne's kits, what they'll do is, they'll sort through it, they'll find the serial numbers, the serialized parts will be matched up with their brothers, and unserialized parts, like a gas block, you know, it's completely random. The odds of you getting the gas block that's original to the kit that you're getting is zilch. Extremely slim odds, and you wouldn't be able to tell either way anyways. And even on the serialized parts, a lot of them on the later guns will only have the last three digits, so there's a chance that uh, the serialized part that you have doesn't even match, even though it's the it's, even though it's the same last three digits. It could have been, uh, you know, the thousands of the place was different, so it actually came from a different gun. So, one thing I find really cool about these PLO kits is that you get them, or you got them as they were when they were cut up, and you get a lot of really cool stuff from that because people have been hey people have gotten like AKM kits with East German furniture and just like all sorts of stuff but um with the age of this kit been in the United States since you know at the latest 2003 I think you just never know what's been mixed and matched but judging by the paint I really believe that basically all these parts here are original to the gun. Another thing about PLO kits is that usually all of this will be populated. You'll have one whole barrel assembly connected to the front stuff, but unfortunately one of the previous owners uh, tried to get the barrel out and also probably to make it easier took the barrel components off. But based on the matching paint again here and on the front side block on the gas block, on the rear sight block, 800 meter rear sight. I believe that these are all original to the gun. The two parts that I'm kind of iffy on is this muzzle nut. Um, I haven't even found any stampings on it. I couldn't even tell you if it's Russian or not, but that's kind of a, that's, that doesn't really bother me all that much. And the handguard retainer. But given how, like, rusty it is, see it's rusty on the inside but not on the outside, there's no real paint to speak of. So I'm not sure on it, but it's probably original as well. And as for the handguards, this wood is probably original because it's attached to the original gas tube. Which leads me to believe that the other wood is probably also original because the finish and condition matches. Which is all equally bad. The, uh, oh yeah, I'm still not done with the, uh, the rear stub. Cool thing about the milled, the AK-47s, I say AK-47, I know it's just for simplicity's sake. I know that actually it's just AK, or in this case, AKS, but in the United States, you know, people refer to the AK as a lot of different things, so it's easier to just say AK-47 to make my point. But on the AK-47s, before they switched to the AKM, the underfolder stocks and the regular stocks had this really downward sloping angle. So if you see this as being, you know, parallel to the barrel, the stock slopes down steeply. Another cool thing that I noticed is that it appears they use the same pistol grip nut on 
the underfolders as they do on the fixed stock rear stubs. This is a Polish fixed stock rear stub. And these rivets right here hold the pistol grip nut on, but they also hold on this bottom tang, which helps hold the stock on. So I guess what they did was they assumed that since this, these two rivets, actually a third one, that would be right here, weren't going to be holding on the uh, buttstock, that it didn't require as much strength. So they just did one rivet, but they just omitted the second one. So I thought that was a pretty cool detail. And another thing about the rear stub, I'm just gonna put a lot of different things in there. But most of the Type 3 underfolders that I'm familiar with have flat backs to them. Whereas this one comes to a point much like a Type 2. If you look at Type 2 underfolders, all of them will be like this. Being that this is a 1958, I didn't expect it to have any carryover Type 2 parts. A lot of earlier Type 3s will have things like Type 2 gas blocks, which this one doesn't have. This is a Type 3 gas block. But um, I looked it up and I actually found some examples. My friend helped me find an example of a Type 3 that has a pointed uh, a back end like this. So that kind of makes it a little bit more unique. Top cover, pretty standard fare. It's uh, re or it's ribbed on, I don't know what you would call that. It's stamped in on that side, stamped in on the other side. Big long uh, little tensioner thing for the rear side base. And serial number matching. Recoil guide rod. It's telescoping, which is unique to the milled kits. You wouldn't see this again until the RPKs came around. They also have telescoping guide rods. And matching. With a little proof mark and a hardness test right there on the button. So like I said, even though this kit has a lot of warts, probably why a lot of people avoided it. I have a completely matching, uh, as far as I can tell, all original Type 3 PLO kit like this. I'm pretty happy about it, and I don't think that any of this stuff should present a problem. Uh, let me think. Is there anything else I missed? Oh yeah, with the uh, Type 3s, I can't remember if it's the same way with the others, but the sling loop actually kind of dovetails in. Not really dovetail, but like that. There's the trigger guard. It's a really large milled lever on it. This one also has the chipping the chipping paint on it, which makes me think that this is original. And uh the other thing is that it matches up really well to the rear stub, which uh, isn't just a coincidence because the rear stub is cut at this unfortunate angle. So I do believe that the trigger guard is original as well. I guess that's about it. I've talked for 30 minutes, so I doubt that anybody's still watching this video at this point, but if you are, you're a trooper. And I hope I haven't bored you too much. Uh, thanks for watching, I guess. And I uh, look forward to another video when I get this thing put together. <laughs>